I'm going to open us up by reading a couple of passages of scripture, praying, and then I'll introduce to you who is going to be speaking to us tonight. The first passage that I want to draw your attention to is in Galatians chapter 2, starting with verse 9. We'll read verse 9 and 10. If you want to turn there in your own Bible, that would be great. But just a couple of observations that should launch us forward into why we're doing this this evening and why we need to know about the gospel rescue mission, what they do, and so we can think biblically about all this. This is halfway through Galatians chapter 2, and it's when Paul is writing to the church at Galatia about when he first was converted and how he went away for a few years and studied deeply on his own. But then he ended up going to Jerusalem to meet the other apostles and having a conference with them. They recognized that God had set him apart for apostolic ministry and he recognized that God had set them apart for that as well. And there's just an interesting little blip that happens in verse 10 that I want to draw your attention to. And this is the just the instincts that people who love Jesus, they start to have these kind of thoughts, and this is their focus. So starting in verse 9, it's kind of in the middle of his thought, but this is what God says through Paul. And when James and Cephas and John, Cephas is Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me that we should go to the Gentiles, to the, those who aren't Jewish, and they to the circumcised, those who are Jewish. He's talking about the gospel. Barnabas and I will go to the Gentiles with the gospel primarily, and the rest of these men will primarily go to the Jews with the gospel. And then verse 10, only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. These apostles say, we recognize that God has set you apart, Paul, and Barnabas is your companion in this. You go to the Gentiles, we'll go to the Jews. And then Paul, in writing to the churches in Galatia, makes sure to note that they specifically said only, make sure that you keep a special eye out for the poor. Help the poor. And Paul says, that was the very thing that I was eager to do. So this is what it looks like to be saved by Jesus. Once you're saved by Christ, you have a particular eye for the needy, for those who are poor, those who are weak, and just how Christ expended his riches to save us from death, hell, and God's wrath. So we, in our infinitely smaller way, we are eager, like Paul, to expend ourselves and whatever God has given us so that we can remember the poor and help the poor. All believers must be eager to do this. And really, if you're a Christian, you are going to be eager to help the poor. Now, another passage in Acts 20. And this is later in Paul's life. This is at the very end of his speech to the elders that had come from Ephesus, the pastors and overseers of the church in Ephesus. They came to where he was. He's about to go to Jerusalem. He tells them, this is the last time you're ever going to see me. You'll never see my face again. I know that persecutions await me. And he says in verse 35 of Acts 20, And all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. This is an instinct. This is the not really an instinct as much as it is fruit from God, the Holy Spirit, filling you and dwelling you, is that you have a care for the poor and the needy. And this is why Paul just includes that little piece in Galatians 2 and saying, I just want to make sure that you know, they said, remember the poor. And then right before he leaves the Ephesian elders, and when he's speaking to them, he finishes all of this with, In all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus, 
who he himself, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. The gospel rescue mission in Muskogee is frequently engaged in that exact work, helping the weak, not just being a hand out, but being a hand up, trying to really help people. And so Rich Schaus is here tonight, is the director, and I'm going to invite him to come up if he would, and I'm going to pray, and then Rich is going to share with us about the gospel rescue mission, what they do for somewhere around 30 minutes, and then we will get to ask him any questions that we want to. Okay, so let me pray and then Rich will come up. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for sending your only son to be the propitiation for our sins, to reconcile us to you through his cross. We thank you that Jesus said it is more blessed to give than to receive even with his own blood. And we ask you to help us to be more and more generous, to be more active in helping the weak and the poor. And we thank you for the work that the Gospel Rescue Mission does. We thank you for the work of Rich and all those who work there. We ask you to bless their efforts and help them to love those in need like you have loved us. So open our eyes, open our minds, open our ears, open our hearts now as we listen to this presentation and fan the flame within us to love the weak and the needy. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Rich, would you come? Well, at some point in 1951, my grandfather was in the Korean conflict. And as he was uh, in the midst of, of a battle, uh, a grenade landed somewhere near him and a man by the name of John uh, jumped on that grenade and saved my grandfather's life. Uh, as a result of that, my grandfather survives the Korean conflict. He comes home, and my father is the first child born on his return, and his middle name was named John, and multiple people in my name and my family are named John because of this man who gave his life that my grandfather might be alive. I, obviously, I would not be here today if it wasn't for this man. In the same way, I take this even deeper that Jesus died on the cross for me. When I despised him, I hated him, I badmouthed him, I talked negatively about him, I deliberately chose sin, but Jesus says, I love you anyway, Rich. And I am still in awe over that. And I tell you the truth, I will do absolutely anything that he asks me to do. Not to earn his, his, his uh, praise or, or earn anything from him, but just to, because I feel so full of grace and feel, feel so grat filled with gratitude over what he has done for me. So as I begin to share with you about the men and women of the Gospel Rescue Mission and what we try to do with them, I, I want you to know that, that Jesus has called me to do this. And he calls me to do this, and it is not an easy place to be. Many step in to do this sort of work thinking, uh, as I did, this is easy. I'm going to go in and everybody's going to be uh, just so grateful. I'm going to give them a meal, so grateful uh, that I'm going to give them a roof over their head that uh, that they're going to be open to the gospel and everything I share is just going to be so anointed by the Holy Spirit that everyone's going to get saved and that it ends up not being the case. <laughs> what ends up happening, the more the truth is that these men and women will capture your heart. They are beautiful men and women. Um, and no matter what they look like on the outside, you can look inside and you see some. There's a, a man who has often been there by the name of Marshall. And Marshall is, is and my staff all know he's my favorite. Uh, but he has cussed me out in more creative ways than anybody else I've ever met. Uh, he threatened everybody with a butter knife at one point. Uh, we had a uh, mobile dental unit, and uh, this is one of the parts of the culture of poverty, is that they are afraid of needles. And so when, uh, when, they, when the dentist comes out with a needle, and that's what happened, the dentist comes out with a needle, he freaked out and strangled the hygienist who was right there because uh, she was closer than the dentist. But that's what Marshall, Marshall is. But I love Marshall. And in his, maybe in his uh, uh, exterior, uh, he is gruff. In his exterior, he is very rough. But inside of him, Jesus loves him. And Jesus has called me to love him just the same way. To jump on a grenade if it takes to, to, to save Marshall's life, to, for him to live one more day, so that way maybe he will hear the gospel, he'll be open to it the next time it comes around. So I want you to know that I would die for Marshall. 
I would give up my life for any one of the men and women who come into that facility. And we almost, we thought we had our first uh, live fire action uh, at the mission last Friday. It turned out to just be a mental health breakdown. But we had the SWAT team come in uh, and raid the place thinking that they were rescuing a hostage. Uh, but that turned out not to be a case. But uh, I, it doesn't matter. If, if it was a live shooter, active shooter, I would be right there to take it on because that's what God has called me to do, to love these people, give my life up for them if needed. Uh, if you have a Bible, I want to actually describe what we do at the Gospel Rescue Mission through Scripture. Now, I happen to find uh, all the psychology in the world, that's, night, that's pretty cool, it's pretty neat, pretty educational, I, I like all that, but it doesn't change lives. This book, the Word of God, will change lives if you just listen to it. So John chapter 5 is where I'm going to start this evening. After these things, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem, by the sheep gate, a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porticos. In these lay a multitude of those who were sick, blind, lame, and withered waiting for the moving of the waters. For the, an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever then first, after the stirring up of the water, stepped in was made well from whatever disease with which he was afflicted. A man was there who had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he was already a long time in that condition, he said to him, Do you wish to get well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. Immediately the man became well and picked up his pallet and began to walk. Now, it was the Sabbath on that day. So this man has been hanging out in the waiting room of the hospital for 38 years. The first question Jesus asked this man, if you're in the waiting room, obviously you're wanting to get in to see the doctor. You're wanting to get better. For 38 years, that's pretty dedicated. That shows a, a man who has a desire to get well. Except, when Jesus shows up, he asks him if he wants to get well. The man does not take the moment to answer. He doesn't actually say, oh, well, uh, obviously, Jesus, I've been hanging out here for 38 years, day in and day out, waiting, hoping that maybe today is my day. And in fact, I would, the first time I ever read this, uh, back when I was uh, first a Christian, I said, that's the stupidest question anybody could ever ask, except for the fact this man's been there for 38 years and he has not taken the steps to do anything different. Jesus says, well, do you want to get well? Well, this is exactly what we do at the Gospel Rescue Mission. They walk in the door and I say, well, do you want to get well? We say it in different ways and a lot of, we try to be creative and not just say the exact same question every single time. But do you want to get better? Do you want to experience all that life has for you? Uh, do you want to get well of your addiction? Uh, do you want to get well of your past choices? Do you want to get well? And without a, even a glimmer of a wait, almost everyone says, oh, of course. But then they're going to come up with an excuse why that's not going to happen. Well, I, I can't do that because nobody's going to give me an opportunity. Nobody's going to give me a chance. Nobody cares about me. My mom did this. My grandfather did that. Uh, I, uh, I have this injury. They have a label that they stick on. Themselves. Well, I'm a felon, so you can't expect anything out of me. I'm, uh, I'm an addict, so you can't do anything there. I'm disabled. And what we first have to do is look at them and, and see, well, how does God see you? See, I believe that you can have an addiction but not be an addict. You have some challenges, we're going to work through that. Being an addict is, is a label that you don't have to live up to. But in their mind, I can't get past it. You don't have to live life as a felon. I have someone, I, I might have a felony on my record, but it doesn't make me a felon. I might have a disability, that doesn't make me disabled. I can do a lot of things if I get past that identity, who I think I am. The biggest challenge we face with the men and women we serve over there is they have no clue who God says they are. So we try to share with them their identity. We, we tell them, you know what? Jesus loves you. And, and you have some stuff in your past that maybe you're not proud of. You have some stuff in your past that maybe you're not comfortable with. But 
Jesus still loves you. My last conversation with Marshall was Marshall cussing me out and me saying, I love you, and I know Jesus loves you too. I love you. I love you. I don't know how many times I just said I love you. Every time he cussed me out, I would say, I love you. And he didn't even know what to say after a little bit. He finally just gave up. <laughs> Jesus loves these men and women, and he calls us to love them just the same. But he also calls them to take some action. This man only makes excuses. So Jesus says, hey, you know what? Why don't you pick up your pallet, pick up your mat, and walk? Just do it. Take action. And then when I read that, I remember that Jesus had another parable that he shared. He had a story he told about two sons, and, and the father goes to the first son and says, hey, I need you to go out and do some work in the field. And the son's like, absolutely, father, I'm happy to do it. But he never does it. And the second son says, no way. I would never do such a thing. But then he decides, I'm going to go out, I'm going to do it. Well, a lot of people who come to the church, they come in and fellowship with, with other believers. God has called them. He has put something on our hearts and says, I need you to go do it. And most of us in church are saying, absolutely, I am all in. Because we're in church, we're all excited, right? Uh, we're surrounded by other believers. We have the encouragement of us, those around us. But then... We go out and actually try to do it, and it doesn't come out the way we imagined. It's really easy for me to perceive hugging someone who hasn't showered in, in a month or so. But to actually do it, and you start to get a little bit closer, that's where the rubber meets the road. That's where it takes the Holy Spirit in you to say, you know what, I can, I can hold my breath for just a little bit if I need to. I can overcome this. Or uh, someone else uh, who uh, is, is just spewing anger and bitterness, but to love on him anyway. It takes the Holy Spirit to do that. Jesus is calling us, not only these men and women we serve to take action, he calls us as a church body to take action. I say this to the men and women there on a regular basis, and uh, I recently put it in, a, in a, a column that I wrote. Words are cheap. Anybody can say anything, and it means nothing. I want to see action. Now, I was raised on the border of Missouri, and I spent a lot of time in Missouri. Most of my family is still in Missouri, and the, the model for Missouri is the show me state. So show me. Now, this isn't about earning salvation. This is saying that God has so impacted me that now I'm going to go out and do something. I'm going to pick up my mat and walk. I'm going to do whatever it takes to honor the king. Not to get some sort of applause, uh, not to uh, pipe, you know, blow my own horn, not to do any of those things. I just really want to fulfill what God has called me to do. I'm going to pick up my mat. There's nothing special about my mat. My mat's, uh, it's a flat old mat, and I sleep on it, and then I get up, I pick it up, and I take it with me. That's what God has called me to do. And that's what we do with these men and women. Pick up your mat. Yeah, don't tell me you're a felon. I don't, it doesn't bother me. Uh, the stories that you would hear. And then you come to understand who they are. The labels are things that man has done to other people. For a while, I was, I was cool with felon, but when they were a violent felon, I was a little bit standoffish. I was like, okay, oh, a violent felon, you know, maybe I don't want you to know where I live. Uh, maybe I want to be a little bit cautious with you, uh, all those sort of things. But I've also learned that violent felon means nothing either. We got a little girl who comes to the mission once in a while, uh, and she's about uh, this thin, uh, she's got arms that are like sticks. Uh, it's years of meth addiction. It's, it's really just deteriorated her body. But she's a violent felon. And I thought, well, how did you get to be a violent felon? It, you couldn't hurt anybody. And what it turns out, and when I got to know her and listen to her story, was at one point she was high and she got angry and kicked a police officer. And that got her the label for the rest of her life from the time she was mid-20s up till today of a violent felon. So she goes to apply for a job. Guess what? Violent felon can't hire you. She goes to apply for an apartment. Oh, man, violent felon can't stay here. That's the way our world is. But I say, let her pick up her mat and walk. Let her show us by her life something that is new. There was a man by the name of Adam Brown. And Adam had a long criminal history. An incredible lengthy 
record. He had had a methamphetamine addiction. He uh, ran the streets in, in uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, did a lot of really negative, bad stuff. But Adam had a praying father and a praying mother uh, who would visit him, who eventually uh, drew the line and said, I'm not going to help you anymore, Adam, until you start to get your life back on track. We're, we're only, we don't want to feed your addiction. We're not going to give you any money to go out and buy your drugs and alcohol and other things you were doing. We don't, we don't want to do that, Adam, but we love you. And when you're ready, we're going to be all here by your side. Well, Adam finally responded to the movement of the Holy Spirit. Several years had gone by. I mean, the parents, uh, if you pray for somebody, you think, well, this is going to happen pretty quick. But sometimes it takes a while. Adam finally responds and he changes his life. He goes, I want a new life. But he, he ran into some of the things I was just talking about. Hard to get a job. Hard to find a place to live. Uh, hard to be accepted. Even in the church, it was hard for the people to accept him. You know, he'd be having a seat all by himself because nobody wants to sit next to someone with such a criminal record. Might soil our clothes to have someone like that in our church. But Adam said, i, I got to do something in my life. He said, it would be really great. I would love to join the Navy. The Navy said, no, Adam, your record's too big. And I think, boy, if your record's so bad, the Navy says no. You are bad. But Adam knew somebody who knew somebody who helped him get by. So you know what? We're going to give you an exception. In a lot of ways, that's what the Gospel Rescue Mission does. Is we give them that exception. We give them that chance. We look past all that junk from their past and say, let's give you a chance. I don't know if it's going to work. Sometimes we give people a chance, and I really regret it. Because they do things that are really foolish. They threaten other people, or they break stuff. They throw sand in my shower, and I have to go get a plumber to, to undo it. They, they actually put concrete in our shower at one point. It was dry when it went in, but obviously it hardens up inside the little shower. And it, it's like, man, why did you do that? Well, I was like, I really regret having you here. But we're going to guarantee them opportunity. No matter what they've done in the past. And this is difficult for our human mind. When they have cussed me out or they've threatened somebody, it's really easy for me to say, oh, I can't let do this again. But this happens. Adam gets his chance. He goes in the Navy and he loves it. But something interesting, because Jesus had been working in him, he is a new person. And he has developed character that is unbelievable. Everybody that he runs into loves Adam. They think he is the most incredible, clumsy guy they have ever met in their entire life, and they love him. A little bit like Gilligan. If you're a little bit older, you might remember Gilligan. But they, they think he's great. He's got a character and stands by. He's supporting his friends. He's encouraging other people. He is an inspiration to everybody he comes in contact with. And then he decides, you know what? I kind of like this idea of being on the SEAL teams. Well, if he wasn't good enough to get in the Navy, getting on SEAL Team 6, getting that clearance was going to be an impossibility. But because his character had grown. God had changed him. And this is an important lesson I hope that we will take in. Jesus didn't actually die on the cross to change us. He died on the cross so we could become new creation. Adam was so new that they gave him a chance. And he goes into, he has all sorts of challenges and uh, you know, as he's trained to become a seal, but he pulls it off. He gets in there. Then he decides, you know, I like to be part of SEAL Team 6. No way should he have ever gotten that opportunity. But they give him that chance because his character had changed. Who he became had nothing to do with that old man, that person he used to be. They give him the chance, and he does it. He does an incredible job. Just to make a long story short, over the course of the next couple years, as a member of SEAL Team 6, he has a shooting accident. He shoots out his dominant eye. They don't kick him out. There's people thrown out of the military for much less injuries. Your character is so great. We need you to be here. Then he has a rollover accident with his home beast and loses three of his fingers. Still don't kick him out. Because his character was so high that God had made him such an incredible man of character, of virtue, which is a word we don't use much anymore. I would love to see us use that word more often. That people see men of God, they say, yeah, that's a man of virtue. He is high standing. Too often man of God is kind of derogatory for a man who pre preaches once in a while. But no, I, want to, I think we should be preaching, but I also think we should be men of virtue, be women of virtue. And Adam is such a place that no matter what he does, they never kick him out. Well, that's what we want for our men and women. Whatever they were before they come in, we want to pick up their mat and become this new creation. Every single day, wake up. I'm a little bit better than I was the day before, a little bit better the day after that. And he continued to grow. And this man picks up his mat and he walks. Because he chose to take action with what Jesus said. 
His whole life was different. He became a new creation. Adam became a new creation. If I was going to read on the rest of the passage, I also want us to notice something that I think is the scariest portion of the Gospels in my, in my book. When I see the Scriptures, I say, this is the scary piece. He is healed. He is made new. He is made fresh. He has gotten new opportunities that nobody else had ever promised before. And here he is walking. And who is it that condemns him? Who is it that attacks his new creation status? It's the church of that day. So my brothers and sisters, I, I'm, I don't know your salvation level and where you're at. But if you are claiming to be a man or woman of God, if you claim that you love Jesus, yet you don't love these men and women who are flying the sign, the men and women who are sleeping uh, over by the Civic Center, uh, men and women sleeping along the railroad tracks and other places, and you just randomly see them around town, if you can't love them, you're part of this crowd. <laughs> we have to love these men and women. And what that love looks like it's going to be different than what most people in the church say today. See, I don't believe it's loving to stop by and hand them a sandwich and say, be well and, and be faithful and walk away. To throw a coat at them or uh, there's an organization in town, hands them a tent. Say, go ahead and stay in your addiction. Go ahead and stay in your pain. Don't do anything different. You don't have to change. Just stay out on the streets. Because one of the remarkable things, and this is, this is, partially because of our relationship with this church and others in, the, in town, is that because of you, we can say in Muskogee County that there are more shelter beds, more emergency beds in Muskogee County than there are homeless, based on the state's one-day homeless count. It means we're at functional zero. There is nobody who has to be out there. But all those people living out there have refused to pick up their mat and walk. And when we hand them a tent, when we hand them $5, when we hand them a sandwich when they're hanging out at, across from your place. When we do those things, it seems nice. But I want to challenge you, if you're going to do that, you need to be there every single day handing them another sandwich. If you're going to do this, you have to keep going there. You better do it every single day, or you can do what I think every community should do. And we ha can do this in Muskogee, where other counties in, in Oklahoma can't do this. We got a place for you. How we show love to you is we take you to the place that's going to feed you three times a day. It's going to put a roof over your head. It's going to give you new clothes. Uh, that's going to uh, show you how to make new choices with your life. They're going to share the gospel with you, guarantee you an opportunity to hear the gospel. Because that's what's going to change your life. That's what's going to get you off the streets for permanent. But I do know it feels good to hand them the sandwich. It, it feels good to hand them a blanket or, or one of those things. But how much better would it feel to see them five years down the road, owning a home, being a member of your church, because and, and all cleaned up. A little bit like, not quite as dramatic probably in most cases, but the demoniac. When the, when the people all of a sudden see the demoniac, you remember the story. This is an incredible story. Jesus goes all the way to this place, uh, the garrison, for one man. <laughs> That's it. He's the only one Jesus heals in this little scenario. He goes, boom, he's healed. And everybody's freaked out. They see him clothed and in his right mind. How beautiful would that be able to see that a year from now? But you're not going to see that if you just hand them a sandwich and walk away and say, oh, okay, be fed, be well. To really love them, you have to bring them into the place that's going to love them and guarantee them an opportunity to hear the gospel. And then once they've actually heard the gospel, sometimes 20, 30 times, sometimes from the preaching of some of you, uh, sometimes from just conversations one-on-one, -on -one, I love to sit on the picnic table and just chat. I find it much easier to, to personalize the gospel with, with just a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Sometimes it's just a, a prayer in the dining room before we, sit, before we eat a meal. Uh, sometimes it's a conversation they have after a message. They're debating it, arguing it, and then somebody else is hearing it and saying, but I believe it. It's an amazing thing that takes place. So we're going to give him that opportunity. Then if they do accept Christ, if they do decide today is the day I'm going to give my heart and life to Jesus, then we can disciple them. We can show them how to live this new life. They're going to have a desire for it. It's, this isn't beating them over the head with anything. It's saying, okay, now that you're a Christian, here's some new things that are going to be happening in your life. 
I desperately needed this when I came to Christ. I came to Christ at 21 years old. And I had already established a lot of negative habits that the world had taught me. I was really good at the world's rules. So I become a Christian. I don't know how to, how do you date when you're a Christian? Well, that was a new thing I had to figure out. Uh, how, do you, uh, how do you choose a movie to watch? That changed. It's like, oh, okay, that, that's bothering me. What's happening there? All of a sudden, that's really kind of awkward. I'm in the movie theater. I just paid, you know, that day was probably six or seven bucks. I don't know what it is today, but well, you know what? I just don't feel right. I just lost my eight bucks. That stinks. I had to choose to do that, but I was taught that. I was you know, a disciple. I was shown how to live this life. It wasn't just go do it on your own. You're, you're fine. So this man gets harassed by the church. And he decides to, to, to f- try to figure things out. And he runs into Jesus and says, hey, you know what? You're made well. Let's live for me now. Let's go live a new life. Let's go live as that new creation. So like this man, we, we find out who they are. We have our felon reintegration program. They do have felonies on their record. We show them how to develop that character so nobody cares anymore about it. Just like Adam Brown, nobody cared about his felony history. We have a young lady who, uh, she actually, we, we had a version of it that we were teaching out of, out of the prisons. And she accidentally got a job. Uh, it was, they, they didn't really read her application very well, which I think that was the Holy Spirit maybe. Because they actually read it, they would have made some phone calls and maybe didn't offer her the job they did. Uh, but she ends up getting a job at a local hotel. And that hotel says, you know what? You're so good. We're going to promote you. And then that's when they found out. Oops. <laughs> we should have made a few phone calls first. But at that point, they say, we like you. <laughs> we think you're pretty awesome. We trust you. So we're going to promote you. And you're going to be the, the manager of this hotel. And she managed that hotel for a little bit. And today, she's an area manager. So she has to, she has to drive all over the place. That's her biggest complaint now. i got to drive to Missouri and Arkansas and uh, Kansas. I'm driving all over the place. I never get to be at home, but I got a great job. I get paid really well. And she's a member of a church, active, who support her, encourage her, who help her through a lot of different things. It's a beautiful experience. Well, that's what our felon program is all designed to do, to help you build the virtue, the character, so nobody cares about that anymore. We have our Freedom Club, which we're actually exporting from the Gospel Rescue Mission, This our, our mission for this month that we're beginning. We're actually going to have our Freedom Club, which is our addiction recovery, that if, if your pastor is going to come to me and say, hey, Rich, you want a cigarette? Probably doesn't have any on him to, to offer. But if he would, he would offer it to me. I'd say, well, no, thanks. I'm not a smoker. That's just not who I am. It's not that, oh, I, and honestly, this is a confession, I used to be a smoker. Many days before that, before that Christ came to my life, I was. So that would be a temptation. I'd have to go through the 12 steps. And, but no, that's just not who I am. That's not who my spirit is. God has changed me. I'm a new creation. There is no temptation. So our Freedom Club is designed so men and women develop the character to say, that's just not who I am. You offer them anything in their addiction world, whether that's uh, tobacco, uh, drugs of any type, alcohol of any type, pornography, uh, health, unhealthy relationships, that's actually an addiction. Work can be an addiction. Anything that you put as an idol uh, above God, and, and I really I consider all addiction to be idol worship. And I don't have time to really get into the deep study of it, but if you study how the idols were worshipped in the Old Testament, and look at what people do in their addictions, it's amazingly similar. Some of the names and some of the uh, angles change, but it is so remarkably the same. So we teach them this stuff. We help them build that character. So way when somebody comes and says, hey, you want a cigarette? They say, well, I don't smoke. That's not who I am. They offer them whatever. I, that's not who I am. And that's our freedom. We're exporting that out to uh, all nine major municipalities in Muskogee County. We actually have somebody who's paying me to get it out into those places and to take that into a place where people don't have to drive into the mission to do that. And besides, people are often afraid of coming into the Gospel Rescue Mission. This takes it right into their communities. We have someone at a senior center uh, in Warner. Uh, we're going to have one uh, in uh, Haskell. Uh, Fort Gibson has a community center we're going to have it in. Uh, so we're working through We're going to have nine of these before this year is out. So I'm pretty excited about that expansion, all within Muskogee County. I have, my funder says, just keep it in Muskogee County. You can do as many as you want. I'm like, okay. We're going to find a lot of places to help these people with addiction do this. Other than that, we get to know the men and women who come into the Gospel Rescue Mission. Yeah, you've been waiting for 38 years to get well. We're going to learn all about them. We have a full assessment. I'm going to figure out physical, mental, spiritual, social, uh, what their past is, their, their financial issues, their, their debts. We say, what can we do to help you actually grow? So what happens is 
we set up a contract with him. I sit down, and my staff will sit down and say, okay, for the next three weeks, what can you do? And we pick out four or five things they can do to move forward with their life. For some of them, it's just basic discipleship. This is a Bible. And some of them might actually start out that, that low, that this is the Word of God. That's a whole new concept. I remember going, I, I went to a Bible college, but I also had to, to do my ROTC. I had to go to a secular college at the same time, and I had to bring my transcripts over to him. And she goes, Acts, what's that all about? What's that? And I said, well, that's, that's a book in the Bible, and that's a class about that book in the Bible. She goes, I thought the Bible was a book. I said, okay, <laughs> there are books within the Bible. The Bible as a whole is a book, technically, and it's a conglomeration of a lot of books. It, it was a really complicated conversation. But that's what we have with our guests. That's where they're starting off. So that contract might be, okay, this is the Bible. It has a book called Genesis. It's at the beginning, a book of Revelation at the end. And we're going to focus in on the Gospels because that's really what, what everything else kind of ties in back in anyway. So let's start there and let's talk about this guy, Jesus, and who, who the Bible says he is. Not who somebody else said he was, but who is Jesus according to this book. So their contract, they do this. And they have three weeks to do these these three or four things. Very reasonable. We agree together with them. This is going to be in their best interest for their future. If they do those three or four things, they continue their stay. Get another contract, another three or four things moving forward. And if they continue to move forward, continue to fulfill their contract without any more of these excuses like this man did in John chapter 5, then they're going to be successful. They're going to keep moving forward. They continue their stay. We had a man who ended up staying about eight months, but over the course of that eight months, not only did he grow in Christ, he started paying off some of his debts. He had fines in three separate counties. That we had a, It was a, a scientific nightmare trying to figure out how to pay back all these different places. Because some of them he ordered a city and some of them wanted a county, all in the same area. It was the same crime, but the county wanted to cut, the city wanted to cut, the state wanted to cut. So figuring out, as we figured this out for him, over the course of eight months, he paid off every one of those fines. It ended up being about $25,000 worth of fines. Now imagine this young man who, who's growing in Christ, getting his life back together. He's got a full-time job. He's, he's paying it off with his own efforts because he doesn't have any bills at the mission. He's just using all his full-time pay to pay the, this stuff off. But what if he didn't pay it off and all of a sudden he's got to pay rent and he's got to pay his utilities and he's got his phone bill and he's got all this stuff. He, he's going to miss a payment somewhere along the line. And if you miss a payment, it's a $100 fine just for missing that payment. So that's another $100 he doesn't have. I mean, he's going to have to work another number of hours to pay off that $100. He's never going to get his life straight again. So we work with them as long as they're making progress, as long as he was making those payments. And he had to make so much of this place and so much of that place. And he was fortunate that his employer said, I would love to be able to support him in this. As long as he's staying sober, as long as he keeps working with me, I'm going to, I'm going to match anything he's paying. So I kept track of what he was paying. I called the boss, and the boss sent a check, and he didn't even know about it until it was all done. That's what the Holy Spirit, what God does. He starts to work things out when you're living for him and moving in that direction, serving him faithfully. How beautiful was that? If we get to know them, we help them move forward. We show them how to pick up their mat every single day and continue on following after Jesus. So I, I promised I would take some time to answer some questions, and uh, I'll close up after we, I answer any questions that anybody might have. So what's the average stay for someone at the mission? I know it seems to be there are people who don't meet their contracts, people who do meet their contracts. What's, uh, what's the average stay for someone at the mission? So the average stay is actually less than three weeks. Most of the people who show up have given me their, their voice, have said, I want change, I want something different, but their actions are showing something different. Uh, so they, um, they may just need some mental health help, so they refuse any kind of future help with that. Uh, they may relapse to their addictions. Uh, that's pretty common. Uh, sometimes the dealers sneak in. I have a list of people who are drug dealers in our community that you can't come into my mission until I get some verification that you moved on with your life. Yeah, I don't, we don't have a forever list. Uh, but I definitely have to make sure they're not drug dealing anymore before I can let them back in there, as a protection there. I still love you. I still care about you, but you're a little hazardous to my people that I love too. So it is a delicate balance. So less than three weeks for most folks. And there are actually people, this is one of the most interesting things that I, have, that I, I haven't figured out why this is. So someone doesn't get their contract. And let me tell you a little bit about how the contract even gets to the contract. They're there for two weeks. 
And our guests who live with them every day have three votes, and staff have two to decide if they continue their stay. We're letting the guests let us know what's really happening when we're not looking. And so it, it is possible we say in two weeks, sorry, they know who you really are. You, you can't be here right now. But when you're ready, come on back. We'll chat again. Others just don't fulfill their contract. Others just blow out. But what's amazing is how many of them will camp out within three or four blocks of the mission. And they come back on site every single day just to say hi. These are people that we supposedly kicked out and we hate. But they know that we're safe. They know that there's something there that they are desperately wanting and needing. So if you drive around our mission where the mission's at and you see uh, across the street there's uh, two little stone buildings, people are camping out there almost every single day. There's an a air conditioning and heating repair place uh, right up the sidewalk almost, almost every single day right in front of their business. I'm like, don't do that. That's being a bad neighbor. But they, they know that it's a safe and healing place. And they desperately want it, even if their spirit, who is contrary to the spirit of, of, of God, won't let them in. It, it's, it, they're fighting against it. Like, uh, Paul kicking against the goads. That's what's happening for a lot of our folks. But what I also share this. Most of our guests who are successful have been there over a dozen times before it took. It takes a lot of opportunities. We have to keep saying, I know last time it didn't work out well for you. I know last time you threatened everybody in this place. Or uh, we had two guys that, that, and hopefully this doesn't happen during the chapel when you're preaching and you're there. But we have a guy, and this is actually a, a drug thing that takes place. It's a drug that uh, used to be called Spice, but they have a new fancier name for it. I, they change it every few months of what it's called. It's a, it's a fake marijuana and when people are on it, they can't handle having their clothes on. There's something about it that just, they freak out. They start running through naked. So last time you were here, you were naked. So if you can keep your clothes on, we're going to work with you. It's only a requirement for you today. We're going to work with you. But it can be really awkward having some of these conversations. Uh, but they, even him, he's, he hangs around the neighborhood. He's seeing the safe thing. But there's something in him that just says, ah, I, I won't give in. I won't change. I won't keep my clothes on with those people. Because I noticed when he's out on the street, he's always clothed. But somehow he feels so safe in the mission, he rips his clothes off. I, I wish it wasn't that way. <laughs> but it is, that's the Holy Spirit right there saying, I, I want to be here for you, but the, the spirit inside man is sometimes contrary and it opposes what we're doing inside of that. Um, you kind of, you kind of already hit some of this as far as with the contracts and stuff, but so let's say somebody comes to the mission What's that whole process look like as far as, like, they, they are accepted to stay or they're not? And, like, just all the way, I know they have to meet their contract and that type thing, but what other conditions or what do you look for as far as, like, allowing them to stay? Um, and then the second question, like, what do you do with kids? Okay, so we got two, let me answer the first one first. That one's the easy one. We accept, we have an orientation every Monday through Friday at 1 o'clock. Anybody, no matter what their state or condition is, can come to that orientation, and most of those are going to get in. Now, we do have some challenges if they are medically fragile. We are not a medical facility. So if you need uh, someone to bathe you and to dress you and to take care of wounds, we're just not doing that. But we, what we do is uh, we have a list of people that we will call. And so we won't, we're not just going to chase you out and say, just dump you, get out of here. I'll tell you, hospitals dump on us on a regular basis. We had guys show up in the hospital last Wednesday or Thursday with no shoes. Like, man, he just walked across the parking lot. <laughs> we got to go find him some shoes. So that was the first thing we had to do. But he, there's no way uh, this man, he, he actually had a bracelet on, say, falling hazard. It's like, oh, man, this is going to be tough for this guy. And we, they sent us three of those all at the same time, all with the same bracelet. Okay, we don't have a medical facility. <laughs> How are we going to help this person out? So other than the medically fragile, we serve everybody who shows up, 100%. They have their, their time. We're going to get to know them, give them two weeks of, of stay. Uh, the, even those medically fragile, we may keep them for a day or two if it takes that to help them figure out where we're going to get them next. Uh, but we try to get them into a place right away. They need uh, assisted living or something like that. We try to get them that right as quickly as we can because we just can't help them. Uh, during those first two weeks, they're experimenting with some of our classes. They're going to go to our chapels. They're going to go to our Freedom Club. Uh, anything they want to experiment with. Uh, they do sign our... You know, say we're going to be nice to each other. We're not going to beat each other up. We're not going to lie, steal, all this. We're going to be good. And they make that promise. And they got two weeks. No questions really asked except for name and, uh, you know, 
gender, those sort of things to get you put where you're at. And then at two weeks where they meet with our panel of three guests and two staff, where they get to stay before them uh, with a, a vision board of what they want with their life. That this is what I really would love to see happen. If I had my dream come true, this, this is the house I live in, this is the, the life I've lived in, li- I would li- be living, who I'd be living with, uh, all these different things in their life, physical, mental, spiritual, and social, uh, all those things, what would they have in their life? And almost all those are going to give us a clue of how we can minister to them later on. And then the panel will decide, and then that's when the contract comes up. Now, with children, a, a mom or a dad comes in. We have a space for mom with children or dad with children. So we often have kids there. And so they just stay with their mom or stay with their dad, uh, whatever is most appropriate. Uh, we'll put them up in there. Uh, we have a room back uh, in the men's lounge for men with smaller children, uh, or even teenage boys can be back there. I've not, because I'm a dad who had a teenage daughter, she's 22 now, uh, I, I, don't, I don't want her back in the lounge, the men's lounge. <laughs> You know, when she was a teenage girl. So we actually have a different room. Uh, we call it our flex room. So put a dad with teenage daughters in there. Just do a little bit more uh, public. So we can keep an eye on it. So yeah, we take kids uh, anytime they show up. Okay, so actually putting it into practice, say for, you know, we have a lot of mothers that have small children what is something as a mother that I stay home so I have that maybe some spare time uh, that I want to invest? If you're a stay at home mom, you don't have any spare time. <laughs> oh, I know, but you know, I would like to invest. That's something I've wanted to do for a while. But what does that look like for someone like me? What's the best way to serve? I think the very best way, for a, particularly for a mother, is to understand this most of our moms who come in were not mothered before they became mothers. So they have no clue. I mean, even when I. I thought I knew what I was doing when I became a parent, but the kids taught me I knew nothing. I mean, it was just the, the way that really came down. But these are women who would, they had never seen it. Let me give you an example. When I first started doing this work, I was at a different mission. And we had a woman who come in. Her name was April. I'll never forget April. And uh, so she, I'm there, and my wife is visiting me. And at the time, I had two kids. I had my daughter, Rachel, and my son, James. And he was a little baby. And, and, and she's looking at this. She looks at my wife, looks at me, and says, so let me get this right. Okay, there's three years apart. You're married, and you have two kids, to, and they're, they're together, and you guys are married. And she was completely confused. She had never seen an intact family like that over the course of two or three years. And from getting to know April, I knew uh, that her mother had never married her father, and her grandmother had never married her grandfather, and it had been a, a chain of at least three generations that had no intact family. So if you're able to come in and mentor these young ladies particularly, or if you're a man to mentor these men, Show them how to, how to live life as a man of God. I, I, I tell our men, you know, the, the, a man of virtue, a man who is following after Christ, will be a defender of women. He will protect the girls. Not be there, not to be the, this guy who's chasing them down. And uh, because there's kids here, I won't tell you some of the things that these guys do with them, but they, they are chasing these women to abuse them. So if men say, look, I'm a real man. I, I'm, 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 a, I'm solid. I'm strong. I'm not, a, I'm not a, a pansy of some type. I'm a real strong man, but I'm not going to abuse a woman because a real man doesn't do that. So if you can do that, and then as a, as, a, as a mom to say, look, let me help you how to change a diaper. We had a mom who didn't know how to change a diaper. We had to show her how to do that. Uh, we had another mom who, who uh, was just freaking out every time her kid did something, just any kind of whimper. It's like, kids are going to make whimpers. That's, whew, let's breathe. Now, so any kind of coaching for, for those moms would be great. And then to disciple them as they're trying to figure out how am I a mom uh, leading my kids to Christ and all those pieces. It's, a, it's an important role. But it, we live in a generation that now that does not have, uh, my, I have my grandparents were married 50 plus years on, on one side. And the other side, uh, my grandma, uh, she ended up with five husbands before it was all said and done. But her, her last husband was 25 plus years. And I'm thinking that's, the, that's what I am coming through. I have family who's been with me my entire life to support me, encourage me, teach me, coach me. Uh, I make most of my decisions thinking, well, what would Grandpa do in this situation? He was the most peace-loving man I ever knew. Well, they don't have, this generation doesn't have those people. They don't have it. So we have got to become that surrogate family for them to say, okay, let me show you how to be a grandparent. Let me show you what a grandparent would do here, what a, a sister or an aunt might do that's healthy. In the meantime, you got the chance to share the gospel with them that they're not going to hear from anybody else. They think that pastors only do it for the money. They think I only do it for the money. 
They had a guy take a picture of my Jeep the other day and, and use that as evidence that I'm not a man of God. I don't know what the Jeep says that, but I, I got a Jeep because I saved up for it. <laughs> and I like to go cross country and get into trouble with my Jeep. term uh, gospel rescue, rescue mission a lot, um, but I'm not really certain what it is. Is it like a homeless shelter? D describe to me what, what, what it is, where you have them located, and, um, and then like a second question would be, would it be somewhere to where I could bring a seven-year-old? Like her. Yes. You that could I, you know, that. Like, like she's saying, you know, to where I could spend some time and, and, and minister and offer some of my help. Absolutely. Uh, we have a volunteer coordinator. We set up a time of, you know, be appropriate. And we have different groups that you can sit in with them or just one-on-one, -on -one, hang out in the ladies' lounge with them or uh, in the dining room with them, whatever's going to be appropriate at any given time. So the Gospel Rescue Mission, what we consider ourselves is we're, we're a poverty reduction center. So we get to know the men and women who come in. We learn the challenges and difficulties of their life. And we have a shelter program. We're not a shelter. We have a shelter program, though. Uh, we have a feeding program, so we feed the hungry. Uh, we get them clothes uh, every Thursday. If you really want to see something awesome, we do Dress for Success Thursdays. So these are men and women who, a uh, day before possibly, were on the streets who are now dressed to the nines. And that changes their whole dynamics of their thinking. It's one of my favorite days of the week. Uh, so we, we help them learn the skills, but also they're teaching me. Before I got to Muskogee, I've been doing this for 20 years. I always had this mindset of if you got a criminal record, you're paying the price. That doesn't matter. But they're teaching me the challenges that come with a criminal record. And they are teaching me every single day. So I go out and I'm trying to fix some of the justice issues that take place. Uh, I appreciate the work that uh, the abortion, uh, stopping abortion work that's, that's happening. I appreciate the pro-life stand that, that Brett's taken because I hear the other side of where moms are when they've had an abortion and what it does to their hearts and their minds. But I wouldn't have had the same passion for it if I didn't have this relationship with them. So we're, they're teaching us the social issues we need to get involved with and, and to fix because society does have a piece to play in the whole poverty game. So we're located at 323 Callahan. That's our main location right now. But we're in the process of actually expanding, uh, again, small groups going out. But we're also going to have new, a new gospel rescue mission in other communities uh, around the state of Oklahoma. Uh, before I die, I plan on having at least five uh, gospel rescue missions in uh, rural Oklahoma. That's the mission God's given me. This is, this is my audacious goal. I don't know if I can really go there, but this is the, the, what God put on my heart earlier this year, is to reveal the glory of God by ending homelessness in Oklahoma. And actually, I, because of Functional Zero, I believe it can be done. We did it in Muskogee County. I don't see why we can't do it the rest of the state. We actually have been doing the research uh, and I can have a plan for every county except for three. I have no idea what to do in the three of those counties. But I figure when I get there, God will show me what to do then. So that's my audacious goal. So that's what we're going to do. And that won't be just missions in every single county. That'll be helping churches support and encourage uh, people who are on the streets in their county. Some of them only have three or four, so I can't build a whole mission for them. Um, you spoke earlier of just kind of not, maybe the first action not being, here's a sandwich, here's five bucks, something like that. Like, what are some good practical, um, just helpful uh, suggestions or wisdom that you would give somebody in that interaction with somebody uh, of how you would relay everything that you all do and just what you all offer and how to get somebody to the mission as opposed to just handing them a sandwich or something of that nature? Yeah. So what I, what I want to suggest is don't look away. That's the first thing is don't just look away. We actually, uh, it's probably been about three years ago now, three, maybe four years ago, we actually did a, a project where we handed out resumes right across from Chick-fil-A there on the corner where there's always, always a panhandler. We had a big sign saying, you know, the flying the sign, just like you would a normal uh, everyday panhandler, but only instead of taking, we're going to be giving out resumes. And I was out there with him. I was flying the sign with him right there on the side. I wasn't handing out resumes, so if anybody on my board were here, I'm not looking for another job. <laughs> but I was out there flying the sign with him. But what, something that was interesting is all the people, I mean, lots of them, I don't know how many cars go by there every single day, they would, not, they would look away. 
and for me, even though I was only out there for 30 minutes, I have a home, I have a job, I have a family that loves me, I have all that stuff, I started to feel like a monster because nobody wanted to look at me. And that was just 30 minutes. Can you imagine what that might be like hours at a time when you don't have that support somewhere else? You don't have the relationship with Christ, at least if nothing, nobody else, I got at least Jesus. They don't even have that. So first of all, do not look away from them. Look them in the eyes. Acknowledge them as a human being made in the image of God. Every human being is made in the image of God. It doesn't matter where they come from, what they look like. They're made in the image of God. I'm going to look at you. Acknowledge you as human. And then, if I got time and if it's safe, not all of the men and women we serve are safe. Some of them are mentally ill. Some of them are dangerous. But if you are in a position where you are safe, sit down with them and hear their story. Some of the stories they tell you might be true. No, don't get re- reeled in because sometimes they, they ball face, face lie. They tell you stories. My wife's been working with me more lately, and she, got, she came home and was, they lied to me. <laughs> well, I told you they're going to. <laughs> don't take it personal. It's just it's their defense mechanism. It's their survival thing. But hear them. Ask them questions. Get, dive in. Get to know who they are. And then... You can bring them over to the Gospel Rescue Mission at 1 o'clock. Tell them this is how we, as a community, have chosen to serve you. We're not going to give you one meal. We're going to give you three meals a day. We're not just going to give you a, a tent that's going to, uh, when a storm, that's going to be blown away. We're going to take you something more permanent. And they're going to teach you life skills, and they're going to encourage you to live a new life, and they're going to help you move forward. That's what we, we do in this community. And if they reject it, that's one of the hardest parts. You've got to walk away. And it is heartbreaking. I know it's heartbreaking. I, I know these men and women. And, I, and every time they say no, I'm just like, oh, man, Marshall, won't you just come and talk to me? But you got to let them struggle in that. The, the story I like to use is the story of the prodigal son. The prodigal son actually come to his right mind. When it got so bad, when his hunger was so desperate, nothing else to do it. But if I gave him the sandwich, the prodigal son doesn't get hungry enough to get to the Father. And unfortunately, a lot of what we do is we're feeding them and they're never going to get hungry. They never get to the the pigsty. I desperately need them to get to the pigsty if I'm actually going to be able to serve them. And I hate that for them. I really do. It is not said out of a a heart that's angry and bitter or anything. I, I wish it wouldn't take that. But for me, to turn my life around, what God had to do is he had to allow me to get so deep into my alcohol addiction that I woke up in a pool of my own vomit. And I woke up and I said, oh, I need a new life. And I hated that I had to get there, but I don't believe I would have gotten there without that moment. Jesus had to get a hold of me. And what's rock bottom for me was just that it was was in my own apartment, my own bathroom, pretty safe physically. I don't know how I got there, but I just remember waking up in this. But that was my rock bottom. That was it for me. But don't judge their rock bottom by your rock bottom. Because that was mine, but we had a young lady I worked with who uh, overdosed on methadone, was passed out in the middle of the street in a red light district, and woke up in a coma three days later, and that was not her rock bottom. And I think, what else is left for God to do to get your attention? So don't judge their rock bottom, but just get to know them, hear their story. So I'm going to listen to you. I'm not going to buy you anything. I, I really think that you can benefit by going to the Gospel Rescue Commission. love to see you do that. If you want that, I can help you get in over there. Again, be careful. Be very careful. A lot of these men and women are actually kind of dangerous. But that, that's what it is. Just get to know them. Hear their story. Humanity. Any other questions? Sure. Oh, well, Jesus... I love you. You've spoken to our hearts and minds and spirits. You see these men and women who are out in the rain right now. Who are maybe not knowing what the night's going to be like. Who are just trying to find some sort of cover. Some sort of protection from the storm. And Lord, I pray you would bring them in for our uh, shelter services for the night that we would have. The emergency services we have. Lord, I pray also that you would move in our hearts. 
open our eyes to see what is inside of each one of them. Lord, I, I know that there's the next Amazing Grace song. I, I, I see it in him. Lord, I pray you would bring that out in him. There's others that you have great purpose for them. And I pray you would bring out that purpose. Help them to see it, live it, experience it, and to give it to the world. And Jesus, we ask for your blessing on everything we do to protect our families. But more than anything else, make us hungry for you. Let us wake up tomorrow as a new creation, desiring a deep and lasting relationship with you more than ever before. And Jesus, we ask for all this in your name. Amen. Amen. Would you stay up here for just a second so I, I can actually ask you a couple questions? Okay. okay, I thought of a couple that I think would be good. Tell us, we want to get somebody connected with the Gospel Rescue Mission, like Corey asked. Meet somebody on the street. Explicitly, when do we bring them? When can we bring them? And what if it's like Saturday night? And it's so, not one of those. Okay, so if it's an odd time, we have our overflow at 9.45 p.m. every single night of the week. Just bring them to the door of the Gospel Rescue 9.45. Uh, there's only a handful of people in the community who are not allowed to use that. Uh, they've proven themselves to be unsafe. So there's just a handful. But most people, any other time, Monday through Friday, 1 o'clock, get them to the mission, drop them off, and we'll get them in. Yeah. Or help them get out of the that? service if it's more appropriate. Yeah. So 1 p.m. Monday through Friday, and if it's not that, if it's after that, when people may say, well, I've called up there, and they're not taking anybody. That's not necessarily true. No, it's not true. We have 9.45 p.m. We have had space. Uh, we, had, we did have uh, moms with kids. We had a little bit of, uh, we had too many at one point that we couldn't get another mom with kids in. But we have not had to turn away any men or single women uh, for really the last six years. Okay, thank you. 1 p.m. Monday through Friday or 9.45 p.m. every day? Every single day. Every single day. Okay. Uh, another question. How can we best support you guys? What do you need? What can we do? What would you say? I really wish we had more churches that were helping us in this way. And then how can we pray? What can we specifically be praying about? Well, I think this church is doing more than most other churches already. So I appreciate you actually coming and participating with our guests and seeing what's going on in our chapel services. Uh, that's been a powerful tool. I, I, I can't tell you how much that means and that you actually are flexible. Uh, not all pastors know that it, you're going to get interrupted in our church services. It's, it's not a normal, everyday church thing. Nobody here interrupted me. Uh, I didn't know how to act, really. I'm a little confused. Uh, but in this, our service is going to happen, so I appreciate that. Uh, you also support us financially. Uh, always going to need the financial support to keep on doing what we're doing. Uh, we have a budget of over $800,000 a year, and God has miraculously uh, provided that. Uh, so always want to have that. We have a run uh, that we do. Uh, our next one will be in March. Uh, we do a run twice a year, two different runs. Love to have you be part of any part of that. Uh, but really, it's your volunteering, your being on site that makes the difference. Okay. Uh, not just preaching the child, but visiting with them, hearing their story, acknowledging them as human beings. That has a bigger impact than any other things we say and do. Okay. And how can we pray for you specifically? Maybe even just like where you're at right now for what me personally let right me now. yeah so god gave me this audacious goal and i gotta tell you i don't feel necessarily like i'm up to it myself i i, I was like so he he's telling me this and i said no you got the wrong man <laughs> and there's got to be somebody else who can pull this off because i that's too much for me i, I don't see how that's humanly possible uh, to do what you call me to do to have multiple missions uh do all this i i, I can't do it so but I'm going to trust that God's going to give me what I need uh, to do that. But I, I just don't feel like I can pull it off without God taking over. I, I don't know how to describe it yeah. other than I feel like it's over me. It's way above my ability level. That's probably a good thing to shoot for. He'll get all the glory for it. He will. And, and it isn't about, and that's why our statement is reveal God's glory. It's already there. I can't give him any glory. He's right. got it all. Right. But I can reveal it there. It's cut, blinded. People are blinded. They don't see it. Mm -hmm. But I think if we were able to say we were part of a movement that ended homelessness in Oklahoma, God's going to get the glory for it, and everybody's going to say, whoa. Yeah, that's great. All right, let me pray for you right now then.
Our Father in heaven, we come before you and we thank you for the gospel rescue mission. We thank you for Rich. We ask you to strengthen him and provide for him and for others who are working with them, especially for this audacious goal of having five other missions. We ask you to bring it about so that you alone will be seen as magnificent and glorious and it will be it will be so obvious to everyone that you are the one who made this happen. So strengthen him to press on and to keep going and loving his neighbor as himself and loving others as Christ has loved him. And help us to be a church who's intimately and intricately involved with those who are staying at the mission, who are working towards moving forward with their lives. Help us to support them, and we ask you to keep causing the growth. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, brother. Thank you.